Good day everyone. Today, we will be discussing about social linguistics as a bridge in understanding English across the professions. We have already discussed the glimpse of what social linguistics is, and for today, we're going to connect it on how you're going to use it in everyday life as you encounter different people as well. Now, let's first look on the divided terms between social linguistics, society, and language. First off, we have society. It is any group of people who are drawn together for a certain purpose or purposes. The next thing we have with language. This is what the members of a particular society speak. Therefore, both of them are always interconnected with each other. In a society, there's language, and in a language, you will discover what society do they belong. And thus, we arrive at the pinnacle of society and language, which is social linguistics. It is the study of language in relation to society, which is taken from Hudson's work in 1996. And its main focus is society on language. Now, this field of linguistics studies language as it is used in the society in order to identify variability of language in terms of the factors and structures found in the community. And when we talk about variability in language or of language, this refers to the differences that we speak. Even if you speak one language, you seem to discover and determine the differences between your language and other people's languages and the way they also use the language, right? You can discover that there are a lot of people who speak in a calm tone, in a manner wherein nobody will get intimidated, while others speak the opposite way. Therefore, this is what social linguistics is all about. Furthermore, you need now to discover how both of them are related to each other. And as mentioned here, social structure may either influence or determine linguistic structure and or behavior. This is evidence earlier that we talk about society, you can discover the language itself. And when you are part of a certain society or certain community, it also shapes the language that you use and also depending on the people that you are in. Next one, linguistic structure and or behavior may either influence or determine social structure. Indeed, on the way other people speak, you will also determine how they also communicate with other people. Such is the case now on the different languages that we have here in the Philippines. While other people may create biases as based on the language of the speaker, let's say you've heard of the common biases made such as Ilocanos are not um, not very giving in Tagalog they would call it as repot but of course if we translate that in English some would just refer to it as being thrifty okay others would say that Cebuanos are very loud but it's just that they would also create the connotation or the concept that they are really more in fun right and again it affects how they speak and we can also find meaning in how they speak as well. Language in society may also influence each other, which is why this is bi-directional. Language can be taken from what the society tells you to do, and the society may also influence how language does, just like what we discussed earlier. And there is no relationship at all between linguistic structure and social structure and that each is dependent of the other. This is also another view which is taken from Chomsky. Therefore, what I'm saying here right now, these four views talk about the relationship between society and language. You can observe that they differ from one another and that is because these are coming from different linguists. What you need to remember is that on the last part, this is what we discussed now in Syntax of English. And that is because Chomsky believes that this is coming from the innate structure of a person. Alright? So again, these are four different views between society and language of its relationship. 
Now, I want you to analyze the following sentences. You have different ways in order to ask or invite someone to have tea with you, right? You would say, should I make some tea? Would you like some tea? Can I make you a cup of tea? Let's have a cup of tea. How about a nice cup of tea? I can make you a cup of tea. Do you drink tea? Have some tea. There's tea in the pot. As you observe, there are a lot of ways for you in order to invite someone to have tea with you. Which tells us here now on the bottom, language cannot be studied separately from its social or speech context. You have learned a lot of ways in order to tell someone that you love them. And it also goes the same way with how you invite someone to have tea with you. That speaks of the experiences you had as a person. Throughout your life, you have different communicative experiences. And thus, it say here now, language is varied, not monolithic. Social linguistics studies language as it is used in the society in order to identify variability of language in terms of the factors and structures found of the community. And thus, we say here now, we need not to know how language is used in the society and how it helps us in creating, let's say, good communicative experiences and how it affects other people. And now we have the social linguistics of English language. You have the intralingual variation, where it's the variation which exclusively stems from internal dynamics of English. And another thing is that we also have the interlingual variation, the variation that results from the interaction of English with other languages, all right? So we tend to interact with other people, but it's just that the variation tells us that we can create experiences of improving our English coming from just within ourselves or coming from the experiences that we have from other people, okay? And such, we now discover that demography, or such as what you do in your demographic profile, really helps in understanding the language of a person. We have different ways on how children speak, on how teenagers speak, and even how adults speak, right? And that is how we're going to discover how gender and age may help us. Now, it says here that gender, the way men and women use the very same language they speak, differs in vocabulary choice, pronunciation, features, length of sentences, turn takings, and so forth, right? By the manner of how a man would speak to a woman and how a woman would speak to a man and vice versa, and even in the same gender, again would tell us, tell us that Gender really affects the communication process, right? So that is how gender can really affect language use. In the same way, we also have age, when language change is often traceable by studying differences in language use according to the age of speaker, right? You know how a, ch a child would speak to a teenager and how a teenager would respond to the child or even how they would be talking with an adult. Speech communities as defined by age are a factor where issues of identity or exclusion and changes are often prevalent in speech of younger people. Such we have phonetic changes, we have the vowel shifts, the intonation patterns, we also have the changes in meanings of words, and finally, the grammatical changes. As time passes by, growth also comes in your linguistic structure. If you really want to improve, as what they say, you also need to get exposed in different linguistic environments. The more you speak, the more you let your speaking style grow. In such, we also discover the sexist usage versus the gender neutral usage. In languages, there are many words reflecting male dominance, right? In the age we live, though such forms still exist, they are considered offensive by most people, mainly women. Therefore, non-sexist usage of linguistics is suggested. Let's say some examples, instead of using man or men, we can just use individual, right, as a gender-neutral use. Instead of using chairman, we can use chairperson. 
mankind as humanity or human race. Instead of fireman, you can use firefighters. See the difference, class? Again, between sexist versus gender neutral. In such, I show to you now, or I present the linguistics of social psychology. This is what you need to remember, especially that you're communicating with a lot of people nowadays. Now, there are three attitudes between linguistic diversity first. This is not mentioned in this slide, but up to the following slide later on. We have convergence, we have divergence, and we have hypercorrection. These three will be discussed later. Now, an active learner develops a conscious strategy as to how to deal with the remarks of speaker. This strategy can be related to pronunciation, intonation, grammar, vocabulary choice, and discourse features, right? And in the same way that you are really willing to learn a language, you also need to be conscious of what you speak. Because in that way, you're also able to correct yourself in specific situations. Now, let's go first to convergence. Convergence is regarded as an act of complying and cooperating with the speaker and thus a sign of respect for choices. Further, it is considered a polite attitude, right? Now, again, when you are cooperating with the speaker, it's as if you're adjusting your manner, the way you speak, and even the tone. Again, that's convergence, okay? However, divergence is a situation of failure or rejection to accommodate to the linguistic norms of speaker. And you're disres disregarding how they speak. It's just that you want to emphasize dominant in the communicative situation. And again, it really happens sometimes, which is why we need to be conscious of how we speak. Even if we say that we are already well-versed in the English language, does it need to apply at all times? Do you need to speak the same way with your, let's say, your juniors to your seniors, right? Those things are what we need to consider in convergence versus divergence. And the third one, one I've been telling you, is the hypercorrection. Speakers who are more conscious of social consequences of language use tend to be more careful about the choices they make and so they adjust their choices thinking that their language use is wrong. Now, the difference here now is between casual versus careful hypercorrection. While we can also tell it as the formal versus the casual one, right? However, let me give you this situation. When you're buying outside, buying soft drinks, let's say for example on a sari sari store, although you might speak the English way that you know because you've been exposed to it, let's say you've been part of an English speaking community for so long time, and the way you speak English right now may be so well versed that other people may think that you're already a native speaker. Well, that's pretty normal because of the environment that you're in. But what about if you want to speak English still to another community, but it's the case that you might be, uh, in the sense, not so understandable in your part because you speak so highly. So you try to adjust the way you speak the English language. You try to adjust it. Let's say I will try now to adjust the way I speak English, right? And you observe right now that it's so unnatural because I want it to be very understandable for all of you. And if I change it in another way, you might observe now that the way I spoke earlier is a bit different than how I speak right now because that is how you use hypercorrection. When you say casual hypercorrection, it's just when you're talking with other people outside and you need to check and you've checked already that there is a need for you to change the way you speak. As for careful hypercorrection, you're a bit conscious of how you need to say things, right? You consider how you need to, uh, to pronounce this word because you might say this person might not understand the way I speak. And that's the way how hypercorrection works. And it's normal in life because if you really just 
implement and use the way you're so accustomed to it and that other people are not so aware and knowledgeable about it, believe me, you will expect some misunderstandings coming from their end because just of the fact that they can't understand you. You need to realize that at some point in your time, even if you are already well-versed in the English language, you need to readjust yourself. You need to tone down and make other people understand what you're saying. If you can speak formally because that's the way you were trained, then you can also adjust into a much lower. And that is how we are going to connect it with the across the professions part. Such is the case amidst professionals across the job industry, right? You've known that when you already enter the professional world, in the job industry, you will be encountering different people. And such, again, you also need to adjust the way you communicate with them. If you're so casual when you were outside, what about right now? What are you going to do? Those are the questions that you need to ask yourself. Furthermore, there is a thin line between conversational and professional register, overlooking the multitude of speakers every day. Right? Even if you say that there's really just a small difference, or not really small, but even big for some, between conversational and professional register, but it's also about what we call as the communication balance. This communication balance in different contexts should be emphasized at all times. 